and I'd be happy to meet the Honourable Lady to do that. Right, we now go to Liz Twist. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, question seven, Mr Speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Government has introduced significant measures to help mitigate the financial impact of COVID-19. We are committed to providing financial support for people when they need it throughout their life, including when they are near to or reach retirement. The welfare system will continue to support men and women who are unable to work or on a low income or are under state pension age. We now go back to this twist. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, research by the think tank the Women's Budget Group uh, shows that women are at greater risk from this economic crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. The current crisis is pushing more and more women, including those born in the 1950s, into poverty. So what practical steps will she take to relieve the impact on 1950s-born women, already disadvantaged yeah, yeah. by the raise <clears throat> In the state yeah, pension age, yeah, and may I, Mr. Speaker, declare an interest as a 1950s born woman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. The government uh, recognises the importance of supporting adults to effectively plan for the future, and we do recognise this is a challenging time for everyone. And we aim to support older workers, including women who may be out of work because of COVID-19, through the, the summer budget. The Chancellor announced a number of initiatives which will support all claimants, including older women. Uh, the honourable member will be aware that there is a live court of appeal. Uh, case uh, as of yesterday, and I cannot comment further on this live litigation. Chris Stevens. Question 8, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Minister Davis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We have supported people to make a claim to universal credit if they have lost their jobs. We are introducing a st and strengthening our youth offer for 18 to 24-year-olds. This includes a tailored 13-week programme, in introducing new youth hubs and DWP specialist youth employability work coaches. Young people, meanwhile, can be referred to apprenticeships or work-related training at any stage. Chris Stevens. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank the Minister for that answer. But Glasgow South West constituent Caitlin Lee, who has worked for the Blindswood Hotel for five years, will only receive £580 in redundancy pay, which barely covers one month's rent, because young workers under the age of 22 and under statutory redundancy pay law are entitled to half a week's pay, whereas those workers over 40 get one and a half weeks' pay. So will the government address this discrimination and what will the government do to mitigate the mass redundancies of young workers so that they're not disadvantaged yeah, yeah, yeah. any further? Yeah, yeah. Minister. I thank the honourable gentleman for, for raising this issue. Young people can be at a particular disadvantage, perhaps due to their limited work experience, and they might potentially have a, a lower skills level. And I'm concerned to hear this issue. Our job centres are already talking to claimants uh, about the support they can give to young people and signposting them to support into employment, such as the National Careers Service and giving advice on how they can look for further work. And we've also announced our new Kickstart scheme for great Britain. This is a £2 billion fund to support young people at risk of long-term unemployment. Let's head to Glasgow to the SNP spokesperson, Anne McLaughlin. Anne McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My fantastic goddaughter, Tony, is 17. During lockdown, instead of studying or even watching box sets, she became a key worker and helped keep our economy going. For that, she was paid £4.55 per hour. Does the Minister think Tony and, and other people her age are worth any more than that? And if so, will she stand up for the young people of these islands and urge the Chancellor to make it compulsory for employers using the Kickstart scheme to top up this frankly insulting and free-to-them wage? Minister. I'm absolutely passionate about supporting our young people to get the opportunities that they need, and the Kickstart programme is absolutely vital to this. And my officials are engaging with the devolved authorities about how we can uh, make this eligibility criteria attractive and wide-ranging. We're looking at the detail, and we'll have more details for everyone to understand how they can get involved and get opportunities at the start of August. Ten is withdrawn, so I'm going straight to Janet Deby. Janet Deby. 
Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Domestic Abuse Bill still does not include critical measures to protect migrant women and girls, which is a necessity for compliance with the Istanbul Convention. Can the Minister tell us how this government intends to protect vulnerable women regardless of their ethnicity, sexual orientation or immigration status if it continues to fail to ratify the Convention? We'll now head back to Minister Atkins. Minister Atkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, the Honourable Lady knows that we already protect the rights of uh, victims of domestic abuse, the rights of uh, other survivors uh, through a whole range of measures. Uh, not just in the Domestic Abuse Bill, but I'm delighted that she's raised the bill. It's a groundbreaking piece of legislation, but alongside the bill, we are launching this year a pilot project to uh, understand and measure the needs of migrant women who have no recourse to public funds, because we are clear as a government that they must be treated as victims first and foremost. Jerome May. Number 12, sir. Patricia Stay. With permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer questions 12 and 13 together. The Prime Minister has set out his vision to level up and spread opportunity across the country, and the Equality Hub will play an important part in realising that vision by really rigorously analysing where the real inequality in Britain is today, particularly focusing on areas like geogra geography and social background. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Rural poverty is easy to overlook in picturesque areas which other people associate with holidays and a slower quality of life, but it is every bit as hard and destructive for those who are affected by it. Can my right honourable friend uh, advise the House on what action the Government is taking to address rural deprivation? Tuesday. My honourable friend makes a very good point, and we want everybody across the country to benefit from our levelling up agenda of investing more in transport infrastructure, of dealing with educational inequality. And we recognise that deprived rural areas can face additional barriers to opportunity. What the Equality Hub will do is be analysing the data and looking at where those inequality of opportunity is so we can take measures through government departments to address them. James Graham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. How might northern constituencies like my own constituency of Lee, which, according to some measures, is amongst uh, the top 20% of most deprived constituencies in, uh, constituencies in the country, benefit from the plans you mentioned earlier? Sure, State. Well, we want to make sure that no part of our country feels forgotten about, particularly in towns and cities in the north and Midlands, like my honourable friend's constituency. And I can assure him that we will be doing everything we can to look at the roots of that geographical inequality and do everything we can to make sure his constituents have the best opportunity in life. We have a substantive question to Minister Bedner. Mr Speaker, the Government is committed to tackling racial disparities and levelling up the country. That is why the Race Disparity Unit continues to work across departments and their agencies to identify and address adverse variances in outcomes across education, healthcare, criminal justice and the economy. That is also why the Prime Minister announced the new Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities. The terms of reference and membership were announced last week. Up to Yorkshire with Naz Shah. Naz Shah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Baroness McGregor Smith Review in 2017 found that the economy could be boosted by 24 billion if BAME disparities were eradicated. I'm sure the Minister will agree that boost would be really helpful to the economy right now. So can the Minister tell me what the government and her department is explicitly doing to directly tackle structural racism in the workplace? Minister. Thank you. The Honourable Lady references uh, Baroness McGregor Smith's review. This was an industry led review with recommendations that were mostly for the private sector to consider. Following this review, we ran a consultation on ethnicity pay reporting and we received over 300 detailed responses, which we are currently analysing. This is one of the uh, things that the Commission is going to be looking at. It's going to be looking at a broad range of issues, and some of the findings will help to address the issues which she, just, which she has just raised. And Bradley? Number 15, Mr. Speaker. 
This Government is committed to helping individuals from low-income families to progress at work and assist them to increase their incomes and level up opportunities. The aforementioned Baroness Ruby McGregor-Smith is leading our DWP in Work Progression Commission, which is identifying challenges individuals might face and finding practical solutions to help them overcome these barriers across all communities. Ben Bradley. Uh, most likely to drop out of school with no qualifications, most likely to commit suicide, already falling behind in terms of attainment by, uh, compared with all of their peers by the age of five. The plight of white working class boys still seems to be an unfashionable one, Mr yeah, Speaker, yeah, but these yeah, young men have some of the worst life chances of any group anywhere in our country. But the Equalities Act does not touch on socioeconomic disparity or poverty. Yeah. Uh, and it seems like every other uh, group in society has some kind of positive action uh, in place apart from these boys. So what can my honourable friend do to ensure that this is the last generation of lost boys from places like Mansfield that don't have the same opportunity in life as their peers? Yeah. Yeah. The evidence is understood, Mr Speaker, that early language and learning skills have a fundamental impact on a child's education and future life chances. Now, this Government is bringing in extra support for all disadvantaged children, including white working class children, which I know my honourable friend sees as key to no area being left behind. The DfE have set up the Little, uh, Hungry Little Minds campaign targeting low income parents to support their child's early language development, which is key to help them set up for school and boost their life chances. We're now going to go on to Topitals, but Topitals questions to the Minister for Women and Equalities. As Topital 1 has been withdrawn, I call Secretary Liz Trust to answer Topital 2 from Dr Luke Evans, who is participating virtually. Mr Speaker, and as we turn to the summer holidays, I'm interested to know what steps the government's taking to tackle the effects of body image... Minister, please, you've got to answer as Lord Number 1. That's why I read it out, please. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I have been clear that the Government is committed to tackling the abhorrent practice of so-called gay conversion therapy in the UK. As the Prime Minister reiterated earlier this week, this practice has no place in civilised society. Our action will be determined by research to look at how best to define conversion therapy, the scale of the issue, where it is happening and who it is happening to. When that is complete, I will bring forward proposals to ban conversion therapy, making sure that our measures are effective so that no innocent people have to endure these tortuous practices. Yeah, yeah. Dr Luke Evans. Uh, we're turning to this summer holiday recess. It looks like we all need it. Um, with that in mind, what steps is the government taking to tackle the effects of body image issues on young people? And will the minister meet with me to consider the merits of a law that requires a logo to be displayed where an image of the human body or body part has been digitally altered in its proportions? We are working closely with the Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport on the issue of body image and the impact it will have on young people. And I'd be happy to organise a meeting possibly with those ministers who are leading on this issue. I also welcome the work that the Women and Equality Select Committee is doing on this subject. Let's return to Shadow Minister Marcia de Cordova. Mar Thank, you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the government published details of the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities and announced its chair, who has previously said much of the supposed evidence of institutional racism is flimsy. Yet we know that black workers with degrees earn on average 23% less than their white counterparts. The need for action is urgent. Inaction is costing members of the black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities both their livelihoods and their lives. So what assurances can the minister give the House today that her government is serious about finally ending institutional racism? Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think it's important to clarify that Dr Sewell, who chairs the Commission, has not denied that structural racism exists. However, he understands that disparities have a variety of causes, such as class and geography, which the Commission is going to be examining in closer detail. And it is the findings of this Commission which will address the issues which the, the Honourable Lady rightly says are urgent and need addressing. Good to hear. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I welcome the Race Disparity Commission? And as someone who has worked alongside many brilliant organisations to root out entrenched disadvantage, can she assure me that the work that's being done will be be there to build the evidence base so that the policy is based on outcomes, not outrage. I, I absolutely agree with my honourable friend. The national conversation on race has been distorted by some seeking to exploit racial tensions without any recognition of the progress we have made as a multi-ethnic democracy and society. So, guided by the evidence, this Commission will improve and inform this conversation. It will use data to look at complex and interdependent factors in the round to better understand why disparities exist and what action can be taken to reduce them. The Commission will be producing evidence-based recommendations. Mr. I said to Lewisham with Vicky Foxcroft. Vicky Foxcroft. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Federation of Small Businesses' new report, Unlocking Opportunity, identifies a number of barriers faced by ethnic minority led businesses, which contribute more than £25 billion to the UK economy. Will the Minister raise the report's key recommendations with colleagues at the Treasury? In particular, the setting up of a dedicated scheme to help EMBs access external finance, helping them to flourish and our local economies to thrive. Um, yes, um, as the Treasury Minister, I am going to be considering the findings of that report. So I thank the Honourable Lady for raising that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gender pay gap reporting has been suspended because of the coronavirus crisis. Uh, as the economic downturn is likely to disproportionately affect women, uh, does the Secretary of State agree that it's important that gender pay gap reporting start again immediately? Okay. Well, I thank my honourable friend for her question. The key priority during the coronavirus crisis is to make sure we keep women in jobs. Yeah. And that has been our number one focus as a government. Of course, it's vitally important we address the issues that cause the gender payback and we continue on helping more girls study maths and science, which I talked about earlier, and we also continue on addressing discrimination in the workplace. Heading to Scotland to visit Kirstin Oswald. Kirstin Oswald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last year, the UK government consulted on extending redundancy to women. And then, in July 2019, the UK government committed to improving redundancy protection. However, no legislation has been Do you provide an update on what progress has been made, or is it, as I fear, that there has not been any? If you can answer anything, if not, I understand. <laughs> How about I will take the Honourable Lady's question and give her, her a full response. Excellent. Jim Shannon. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. It's always a pleasure to ask a question of the Minister. There are strong links between alcohol and domestic uh, violence. COVID-19 shone a spotlight on the high levels of domestic violence in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. There's a real risk that the ongoing economic crisis will lead to a surge in high-risk alcohol consumption. In this context, what steps is the Minister able to take to prevent alcohol-related domestic violence? Um, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. Uh, we are absolutely clear that alcohol is no excuse for domestic abuse or any other kind of abusive behaviour. We are acutely aware of the need to put victims at the heart of our approach to tackling domestic abuse at this time. And so what we are doing is working closely with domestic abuse charities, the Domestic Abuse Commissioner and the police to understand the needs of victims of this type of abuse and how we can best support them. We are now heading, that's the end of topicals, we are now going to start with the Prime Minister's questions. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we have question one from current Gareth Davies. Gareth Davies. Number one, please, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Gareth Davies. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by congratulating the Prime Minister on his one-year anniversary yeah. as Conservative Party yeah. leader? Yeah. As we look at our long-term economic recovery, can the Prime Minister assure me that Lincolnshire will receive the required funding to boost digital connectivity for all the people of Grantham, Stamford, Bourne and our local villages? Yes, Mr Speaker, indeed I can, and that's why we've not only pledged £5 billion in funding for gigabit-capable broadband 
to across the country, including the hardest to reach areas, but in addition, a £34 million package uh, of Lincolnshire for Lincolnshire Superfast Broadband, helping 135,000 households uh, to benefit from gigabit capable speeds. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, the Right Honourable Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I start by welcoming reports this week of significant progress in the vaccine trials in Oxford? We all know there's a long way to go, but I want to record my thanks and admiration for everybody involved in this huge effort. Yeah. Mr Speaker, under my leadership, national security will always be the top priority for Labour. So I want to ask the Prime Minister about the extremely serious report by the Intelligence and Security uh, Committee. It concludes that Russia poses an immediate and urgent threat to our national security and is engaged in a range of activities that include espionage, interfering in democratic processes and serious crime. The Prime Minister received that report ten months ago. Given that the threat is described as immediate and urgent, why on earth did the Prime Minister sit on that report for so long? Well, uh, Mr Speaker, actually, when I was uh, Foreign Secretary for the period that I have been in office, we have been taking the strongest possible action against Russian uh, wrongdoing, orchestrating, I seem to remember, the expulsion of 130 Russian diplomats, 153 Russian diplomats around the world, while the Right Honourable Gentleman opposite sat on his hands and said nothing, while the Labour Party parroted the line of the Kremlin when people in this country were poisoned at the orders of the Latin Vladimir Putin. Mr Speaker, I stood up and condemned what happened in Salisbury, and, uh, uh, and the Prime Minister, I supported the then Prime Minister on record. So I'd ask the Prime Minister to check the record and withdraw that. I was very, very clear. The report was very clear that until recently the government badly underestimated the Russian threat and the response it required. It's still playing catch up. The government's taken its eye off the ball. Arguably, it wasn't even on the pitch. After this government's been in power for 10 years, how does the Prime Minister explain that? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I really don't, I think the uh, right honourable gentleman's questions are absolutely absurd. There is no country in the Western world that is more vigilant in protecting the interests of this country or the international community from Russian interference. And in fact, we are going further now, introducing new legislation to protect critical national infrastructure and uh, to protect our intellectual property. And uh, he, I think he will find, if he goes to any international body or any uh, gathering uh, around the world, that it is the UK that leads the world in caution about Russian interference. And I must say, I don't wish to contradict the right honourable gentleman, but he sat on his hands, he said nothing. The leader of the opposition, the leader of the opposition, parroted the line of the Kremlin uh, that the UK should supply... Should, I didn't hear him criticise the, the then leader of the opposition. If he, if he criticised the then leader of the opposition, then now is the time for him to set the record straight. Mr Speaker, I was absolutely clear in condemning what happened in Salisbury, not least, not least because I was involved in bringing proceedings against Russia on behalf of the Litvinenko family. That is why I was so strong about it. Um, and Mr Speaker, I spent five years as Director of Public Prosecutions working on live operations with the Security and Intelligence Services, so I'm not going to take lectures from the Prime Minister about national security. The Prime Minister... Oh! I think somebody wants to go for a cup of tea. We don't want an early bath. Prime <laughs> Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister says he will bring forward new legislation. I want to make it clear to the Prime Minister we will support that legislation and work with the Government. It's not before time. 18 months ago, the Prime Minister says the Government's vigilant, 18 months ago the Home Secretary said we don't have all the powers yet to tackle the Russian threat, and he said the Official Secrets Act are completely out of date. Other legislation has been passed in that 18-month period. This is about national security. Why has the government delayed so long in bringing forward this legislation? Yeah. Uh, 
Mr Speaker, this government is bringing forward legislation, not only a new Espionage Act, not only new uh, laws to protect against uh, theft of our intellectual property, uh, but also a Magnitsky Act uh, directly uh, to counter individuals in Russia or elsewhere who transgress uh, human rights. And let's be no doubt what this is really all about, Mr Speaker. This is about pressure from the Islingtonian Remainers, uh, who have seized on this, on this report uh, to try to give the impression that the Russia, that Russia Russian interference was somehow responsible for Brexit, Mr Speaker. That's what this is, this is all about. The people of this, t- this country didn't vote to leave the EU because of pressure from Russia or Russian interference. They voted because they wanted to take back control of our money, of our trade policy, of our laws. And the simple fact is that after campaigning for Remain, after wanting to overturn the people's referendum uh, day in, day out, all the period in, when he was sitting on the Labour front bench, he simply can't bring himself to accept that. Can I just gently say to the Prime Minister, as I did last time, he may have to go to Specsavers. The chair is this way, not that way. If he can address me, it will be a lot better. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, I see the Prime Minister is already on his pre-prepared lines. This is a serious question, a serious question of national security. The Prime Minister sat on this report for 10 months and failed to plug a gap in our law on national security for a year and a half. Mr Speaker, one of the starkest conclusions in the report is that the UK is clearly a target for Russian disinformation campaigns. The report also highlights that this is being met with a fragmented response across Whitehall and across the government. The report refers to this as a hot potato, with no one organisation recognising itself as having the overall lead. That's a serious gap in our defences. This is not about powers, it's about responsibility, Prime Minister. So how is the Prime Minister going to address that gap and make sure the UK meets this threat with the joined-up, robust response it deserves. Uh, Mr Speaker, there is no other government in the world that takes some more robust steps to protect our uh, democracy, to protect our critical national infrastructure and to protect our intellectual property, as I have said, uh, from interference by Russia or by anyone else. And frankly, I think that everybody understands that these criticisms are motivated by a desire to undermine the referendum on the European Union, uh, that a membership of the European Union, that took place uh, last uh, in, in 20 2016, at the result of which he simply cannot bring himself to accept. A serious gap in our Official Secrets Act, laying bare for 18 months, and that's all the Prime Minister has to say about it. One way the government can seek to clamp down on Russian influence is to prevent the spread of Kremlin-backed disinformation. Obviously, social media companies have a big role to play, but the report also highlights serious distortions in the coverage provided by Russian state-owned international broadcasters such as Russia Today. The High Court has ruled that Russia Today broadcasts pose actual and potential harm. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it is time to look again at the licensing for Russia Today to operate in the UK? Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I think this would come more credibly uh, from the Leader of the Opposition had he called out uh, the, his former, the former Leader of the Opposition when he took money uh, for appearing on Russia today. I mean, Mr Speaker, he, protest, Mr. Speaker, he protested neither against the, leader, the, the, the former Leader of the Opposition's stance on Salisbury nor against uh, his willingness to take money from Russia today. Uh, he, he flip-flops from day to day, Mr Speaker. One day he's in favour of, uh, of staying in the EU, uh, the next day he's uh, the next day he's willing to uh, accept Brexit. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the Leader of the Opposition has more flip-flops than Bournemouth Beach. Oh. <laughs> flip-flops. Alexander Stafford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the party opposite bravely abstained on a vote that attempted to tie us into the EU indefinitely, further highlighting the increasing detachment of Labour from the old heartlands like Rother Valley. Can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, confirm that we on this side of the House remain fully committed to delivering our promises to the British people and are restoring our full economic independence on the 1st of January so the people of Thurcroft, Maltby, Diddington and across Rother Valley get the Brexit bonanza and level up that we so deserve? Uh, Mr Speaker, I certainly can give my honourable friend uh, that assurance. That's what the people voted for and that's what we will deliver. Bring Keir Starmer back for one more question. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, pre-prepared gags on flip-flops. This is the the former columnist who wrote two versions of every article ever published. (laughs) 
<laughs> M- Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, in case the Prime Minister hasn't noticed, the Labour Party is under new management. A no front bencher, no front bencher of this party has appeared on Russia today since I've been leading this party. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Prime Minister about the appalling persecution of the Ouija Muslims in China. We've all seen the footage of the Ouijas being herded onto trains and heard the heartbreaking stories of forced sterilisation, murder and imprisonment. We support the Foreign Secretary, the Prime Minister and the Government in their strong and clear condemnation of uh, of China for this in recent weeks. What further steps will the Prime Minister take? And in particular, will he consider targeted sanctions against those responsible? And will he lead a a concerted diplomatic action with our international partners to make clear that this simply cannot be allowed to stand in the 21st century? Mr Speaker, that's why why the Foreign Secretary only uh, this week condemned the treatment of the the Uyghurs, and that's why this government, for the first time, has brought in targeted sanctions against those who abuse human rights in the form of the Magnitsky Act, and I'm I'm delighted he now supports the government. But last week, of course, he didn't support the government, Mr Speaker. I'm glad he's with us this week. I don't know how many more questions he's got, Mr Speaker, since you allow him to to come back uh, back and ask uh, uh, throughout this this session. Uh, We've been getting on uh, consistently with delivering on our agenda. A year ago, Mr Speaker, this was a, this was a leader of the opposition who was supporting an anti-Semitism condoning uh, Labour, a government that wanted to, wanted to, do, wanted to repeal Brexit. Uh, uh, this is a, I represent a government that was getting on with delivering on the people's priorities. 40 new hospitals, uh, Mr Speaker, 20,000 more police, 50,000 more nurses, and by the way, we've already re- recruited 12,000 more nurses and 6,000 uh, more doctors and 4,000 more police. We are delivering on the people's priorities. We are the people's government. And by the way, we're the government that supports the workers of this country as well, with the biggest ever increase in the living wage. We're heading up to Scotland to visit the SNP leader, Ian Blackford. Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yesterday, the Tory party held a political cabinet with the Prime Minister in a panic about the majority and increasing support for Scottish independence. Apparently, Mr Speaker, their great strategy amounts to more UK cabinet ministers coming to Scotland. Can I tell the Prime Minister, the more Scotland sees of this UK government, the more convinced they are the need for Scotland's independence. A far better plan for the Tories would be to listen to the will of the Scottish people. So, before his visit tomorrow, will the Prime Minister call a halt to his government's full frontal attack on devolution? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I really don't know what the right honourable gentleman is talking about. So the, only, the, only, the, only bill I could, the only bill I can think of that's before the House, or will be coming before the House, and, and that I know enjoys a cross-party support, is uh, the UK Internal Market Bill. And Although that is a, a massively devolutionary bill, Mr Speaker, which gives uh, huge powers straight back from, from Brussels uh, to, to, to Scotland, uh, its principal purpose is to protect jobs and protect growth throughout the entire United Kingdom, to stop pointless barriers of trade between all all four parts of our of our country and anybody sensible mr speaker would support it yeah. ian blackford anybody sensible mr speaker would realize from that answer that the prime minister simply does not get scotland in 2014 the people of scotland were promised devolution max near federalism the most powerful devolved parliament in the world instead we got a tory trade bill that threatens our NHS, an immigration bill that will devastate our economy, a power grab that will dismantle devolution, Scotland's powers grabbed by Westminster, workers' rights attacked, the rate clause in the bedroom tax, our NHS up for sale, the overwhelming majority in Scotland's parliaments, its MPs and its people oppose all these measures. How can the Prime Minister claim that this is a union of equal partners when these damaging policies will all be imposed upon Scotland against its will. Minister. I mean, I, I really hesitate to accuse the right honourable gentleman of failing to listen to my last answer. But it was—it's it, very clear that the UK in, internal market bill is massively devolutionary, uh, Mr. Speaker. But that is not its—that is 70 powers uh, passed 
pass from Brussels uh, to Scotland. And I think I, it's quite incredible. Of course, it's, its purpose is very sensible, which is to protect jobs and growth throughout the entire uh, UK. But it, just on a political level, it seems bizarre to me that the Scottish Nationalist Party actually want to reverse that process, hand those powers back to unelected and unaccountable bureaucrats in Brussels. Is that really uh, the policy? I don't think it's sensible. Tom Randall. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I welcome the Health Secretary's call for a review into the reporting of coronavirus deaths. I raised this point recently with a national statistician at uh, a PAC uh, Select Committee evidence session, and he said that the numbers themselves would not change the policy. But would my right honourable friend agree that the true numbers will help improve confidence in the policy? Mm. And as the Royal College of Pathologists pointed out, failing to determine the difference between dying of and with COVID-19 is, is key to understanding um, the um, Getting better information and key to understanding this disease. Yeah, yes. uh, my, my honourable friend makes an extremely important point, and as I've said repeatedly at this dispatch box, Mr. Speaker, it is very uh, important that we uh, wait until the conclusion of this epidemic and have a proper statistical assessment of uh, of where we are. And that, I think, is the course I would I would recommend to him. Ben Bradshaw. Mr Speaker, I was the first member of this House to raise concerns about Russian interference in our democracy four years ago. By blocking the publication of the Russia report before the election on the grounds that the ISC committee has said were spurious, and then trying to fix the committee, isn't it abundantly clear that this Prime Minister has knowingly and repeatedly put his own personal and party interests before the national security of our country? Uh, no, Mr. Speaker, and I think that's a pretty lamentable way of looking at it. Lamentable question, because uh, I, I, after all, if he thought there was genuinely something uh, in the ISC report that showed that, uh, for instance, the Brexit referendum had been undermined uh, by Russia, then he would now be saying it. But that doesn't appear. And I'm afraid what you have here, as, I, as I'm afraid I've told the, the House several times, is the, the, the rage and fury of the Remainer elite. Uh, finding that there is in fact nothing in uh, this report and no smoking gun uh, whatever after all that froth and fury and, and suddenly all those who want to remain in the EU find uh, that they have no argument uh, to, to stand on and I, 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 I regret that they, they should simply move on. Yeah. Thank you Mr Speaker. I visited nine schools in Peterborough in recent weeks. Heads uh, teachers and, of course, support staff are doing brilliant work facilitating e-learning and looking after vulnerable families. But their huge effort is no substitute, substitute for classroom learning. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that it's absolutely vital that we get children back where they belong, in the classroom, from September? I, I do indeed agree with that, Mr Speaker, and it will be a fantastic thing uh, to hear the Labour Party uh, stand up to their friends in the, in the unions and, and issue the same uh, instruction. I think that would be a wonderful thing. Hardy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Social Market Foundation report identified Hull as the area facing the worst economic hit and the slowest recovery to COVID-19. Now, I have stood here in this place and called on the government for support for the caravan manufacturing, for Hull Trains, The Deep, Hull City Council, excluded young entrepreneurs and many others, and received an inadequate response from the government that fails to address the gravity of the situation Hull faces. What the Prime Minister needs to recognise is that you cannot level up by shutting down. So what new support will he give to prevent job losses in Hull West and Hesel? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, we have already given the East Riding uh, of Yorkshire over £21 million to deal with the pressures of coronavirus. We have uh, supported 90 per cent of, of caravan manufacturers, uh, who she rightly supports with the, the furlough scheme. And uh, as she knows, we have not only the Kickstarter uh, fund, the £2 billion fi Kickstarter fund to help uh, young people into work, uh, but also the, the job retention the furlough uh, bonus scheme to, to retain people in their jobs as part of a massive uh, package, £640 billion overall, to get our country moving again and make sure that we bounce back stronger than ever before. A butler. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, schools in Buckinghamshire have done a tremendous job in recent months balancing online uh, learning with physical classes for the children of key workers. 
Will my right honourable friend join me in thanking the teachers of the Aylesbury constituency? And will you also agree with me that it is right to have increased funding for schools, providing more money for all pupils, and so giving them the best prospects for their future? Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, and I am proud that uh, we have uh, fulfilled our promise, our manifesto promise, we're levelling up school funding across the country so that uh, every uh, primary school pupil receives at least £4,000 per head, every secondary school pupil £5,150. And I uh, pay tribute to all the teachers uh, and all the schools in his constituency for the excellent work that they've done in the last few months. Ben Lake. Mr. Speaker, face coverings will become mandatory on public transport in Wales next Monday. Now, a zero VAT rating has been applied to most PPE since the 1st of May, but at present it does not apply to non-medical face coverings. Will the Prime Minister therefore extend the zero rating to these items so that members of the public, especially those on low incomes, are not financially penalised for following the rules? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, Mr Speaker, we, 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 as, as, he, as, the, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, uh, and I thank him very much for his, for his question, uh, we, we have removed uh, VAT from all, uh, from all PPE, uh, including uh, VAT on, on face masks that, uh, as everybody knows, can protect uh, from infection. And that removed the burden of VAT in, in care homes, NHS trusts, and, and for key workers. Uh, for, for, for homemade uh, face masks, those which meet the PHE guidance uh, will be covered and will continue to be covered uh, by uh, the zero rate. But I'm happy to ask the relevant minister to, to write to him to, to, to clarify the entire position. Liam Mellon. Friday is the first anniversary of my right honourable friend becoming Prime Minister, and over the last 12 months, his focus on record funding for the NHS, boosted funding for every school child in, the, in England, and also great progress on recruiting more police officers, has all enabled us to start to address some of the ingrained regional inequalities that we have in our country. Can my right honourable friend ensure that levelling up remains central to his vision for our country for every single year of his premiership. Yes. I thank my right honourable friend and I can absolutely give her that uh, guarantee that uh, in the current circumstances uh, now is the time to, to double down on, on levelling up, Mr Speaker, and that's what we're, we're going to do. And that's why we're rolling out a colossal programme of investment in, in infrastructure, uh, massive investments in our, in our public services and fantastic new technology, because that is the way to give every part of our country the opportunity to realise uh, its potential. Captain Robinson. Thank you very much. Mr Speaker, on the 10th of July, the Prime Minister met Bethany from Crewe during People's Prime Minister's Questions, where she took the opportunity to raise the campaign for the extension of maternity leave as a direct consequence of COVID-19. And during that session, the Prime Minister not only undertook to look at the petition, but understood the significant ramifications lockdown has had on mums and parents who have missed out on childcare support, on health visitor access, on the availability of building bonds with wider family members and the community. Ten days later, can I ask the Prime Minister, has he considered that petition? And with recess fast approaching, can he give an indication as to when the Government will respond to the necessary request to get this precious time back for mothers and families? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, Mr Speaker, I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. I, I well remember Bethany and her, and her question, and I know how difficult this uh, problem is for many people, and uh, I can certainly uh, commit to him uh, to look at it in detail and see what we can do, and I will be, I'll, I'll write back to him. Caroline. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend knows better than most that COVID has an unequal impact on the BAME community, on the elderly, on men, and indeed on the overweight. Can you please update the House on the steps being taken across government to empower people away from fat shaming and away from an over reliance on BMI, which we all know is an inaccurate measure for individual well being? And let us know what he's in, he is doing to enable people to take back control of their own well being. Uh, well, I, I thank my right honourable friend for the, for the extreme tact with which she expressed her, uh, her, her question. And uh, just, uh, but she makes a very important point because I'm afraid that uh, there are significant comorbidities associated uh, with, with COVID, and we do need, as a country, to address uh, obesity and the, the sad fact that we are, I'm afraid, Mr. Speaker, considerably fatter than most other European nations, apart from the, the Maltese, as far as I can tell. And uh, we will be announcing a strategy uh, to help. Oh, no, just respect to, uh, to Malta, Mr Speaker, that's what the statistics uh, told me, uh, we will be bringing forward a strategy which I hope 
uh, will uh, conform uh, with uh, my right honourable friend's strictures. Clive Betts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I don't know whether the Prime Minister has had a chance yet to read the uh, report uh, commissioned by the Ministry of Housing, Community and Local Government into the standard of homes delivered under um, permitted development. That report found properties with no windows, that three quarters of the properties didn't meet the national space standards, and I quote from the report studio flats of just 16 square metres were found in a number of different PD schemes. To put it in context for the Prime Minister, 16 square metres is just about the size of the base of the ministerial limousine which he gets driven around in each day. Will the Prime Minister now change the rules and ensure that in future we never again allow properties to be built, slums to be built, where people are asked to live in a space which is as small as his ministerial car? Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I was proud when I was Mayor of London to change the London plan so as to ensure that we went for Parker Morris plus 10 uh, for our space standards and we will ensure that we not only build back better, uh, that we big build back more beautifully, but that we also give people the space they need to live and grow in the homes that we will build. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the Prime Minister takes a well-earned staycation, will my right hon. Friend mind if I suggest some holiday reading? How Innovation Works by Matt Ridley will give new ideas how we recover from COVID. The Happiness of Blonde People by my dear friend Elif Shafak, who writes about our stories of immigration and the fragility of belonging. And finally, as the MP for the 100 Acre Wood, it's never too early to read Winnie the Pooh to Wilfred. And as Pooh said, you are braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. Sage advice for children everywhere from Wildon. Well, well I, I think that's wonderful advice from my, my right honourable friend, which I will, I, will, I will take to heart. And uh, I, I look forward to, to joining her for a game of, uh, of, of poo sticks in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 100, 100 acre wood. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing, Mr. Speaker, if the party opposite abandoned the spirit of Eeyore that currently uh, <laughs> seems, to, seems to envelop them? Rachel Hopkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Tonight I will be supporting Luton Town FC, who are fighting for their life in the Championship, although businesses across Luton South are doing the same. If Luton needs to go back into lockdown, will the Government introduce targeted financial support so local people can afford to adhere to health guidance? Yes, indeed, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the, uh, the the local authorities in, in Luton. The people in Luton, obviously, are working very hard to ensure that uh, they contain the epidemic in uh, in Luton, as, as, as local authorities are doing uh, around the country. We are supporting them, as she knows, uh, with uh, 3.7 billion pounds uh, of investment, uh, as well as the 600 million pounds uh, in, for the infection fund, and uh, and, and further funds, uh, 300 million, to support local track and trace. But if, of course, if local communities do have to go back into lockdown, uh, we will take steps uh, to support them as well. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I am wholeheartedly in support of this Government's plans to level up our country and build, build, build. Many of my constituents are concerned, however, about a proposed housing development in Chorley Wood. Whilst it is important that we build more affordable homes, this cannot come at the expense of our beautiful countryside. Can the Prime Minister tell me how the Government will balance the obligations local authorities have to build housing under local plans with protection for the Greenbelt? Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, of course, Mr Speaker, and I, th I thank my honourable friend very much for his question because it allows me to, to point out that there is massive opportunity to build uh, back better, to build back better on brownfield sites, and that is what we should prioritise, and that is certainly uh, what we will be telling our local authorities. Yeah. Let's send to Scotland to the Deputy SNP leader, who is audio only. Kirsten Oswald. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Parliament will return after the summer recess to what manufacturing group Make UK describe as a jobs bloodbath because the Chancellor is ending the furlough scheme. We can see the impact on jobs and livelihoods coming over the horizon because of that furlough cliff edge. Mr Speaker, a meal deal doesn't cut it. What will the Prime Minister do to support strategic sectors and prevent unemployment reaching 1980s levels? 
Well, well Mr Speaker, what we are doing already is uh, she knows about the job uh, retention scheme, the, the, the bonus to employers to keep uh, furloughed workers on of, of £1,000. Uh, she knows about the £2 billion uh, Kickstarter fund uh, that we've instituted, uh, these pro the Eat Out Help Out programme, the, the VAT cut, many other things that we've done on top of the £160 billion we've invested in, uh, in incomes and in jobs and, and uh, livelihoods throughout this crisis. But of course, Mr Speaker, we will continue to do more and as the economic uh, ramifications of COVID uh, unfold. And of course, uh, we are preparing for that. And uh, we will make sure we can't, as, as the Chancellor has said, uh, we can't protect every job. We must be clear with the country. We can't protect every job. But no one will be left without hope. No one will be left without opportunity. And this country will bounce back stronger than ever before. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. St Moore's in my constituency was recently placed first in Witches' survey of the best coastal destinations in the UK. Falmouth, a coastal town, constantly punches above its weight with very little. Can my right honourable friend confirm if, that the government is looking at further financial measures as, to help the coastal towns that have been hardest hit uh, in their time of need? Yes, uh, yes I indeed, indeed I can, Mr Speaker. I thank my honourable friend and I can tell her that uh, we're funding 178 projects throughout England through uh, the £180 million Coastal Communities Fund and Truro will receive at least £500,000 uh, from the Towns Fund this year to support the high street and local community. Mr Speaker, as Chair of the all-new parliamentary group on coronavirus, we are leading a cross-party rapid inquiry to make sure that we've learned the lessons from the UK government's handling of this pandemic before a second wave. We've had over 900 submissions so far, including those from bereaved families, those from who have long COVID, and also professional bodies like the BMA and the NHS Confederation. We will be releasing recommendations as we go throughout recess. I simply ask, would the Prime Minister take these recommendations seriously with, see, with the view to acting on them when we come back in September. So I will be very happy to look at uh, whatever her committee produces. Order. I have a short statement to make about select committees. On Tuesday, the 24th of March, the House passed an order allowing for virtual participation in select committee meetings and giving chairs associated powers to make reports. I was given the power under the order to extend it, if necessary, on Monday, the 8th of June. I announced an extension until Thursday, the 17th of September. I can notify the House today that I am no further extending the order until Friday, the 30th of October. Order. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next, I am now suspending the House for three minutes. Order.
I call Nick Thomas Simmons to ask his urgent question. Nick Thomas Simmons. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To ask the Home Secretary to make a statement on the Intelligence and Security Committee's report into Russia. We, we now go across to Minister Brokenshire. Minister Brokenshire. Mr Speaker, this government will not tolerate any foreign interference in the running of our sovereign state. We have long recognised the threats posed by the Russian state, including from conventional military capabilities, espionage, cyber attacks, covert interference and illicit finance. We have been clear that Russia must desist from its attacks on the UK and our allies, and we've been resolute in defending our country, our democracy and our values. And we categorically reject any suggestion that the UK actively avoided investigating Russia. The UK has a record of taking strong action against Russian wrongdoing. This is demonstrated by our responses to the Salisbury attack, the ongoing illegal annexation of Crimea and, just last week, the cyber attacks on research and development facilities in the US, UK and Canada. Our world-class intelligence and security agencies continue to produce regular assessments of the threats posed by hostile state activity, including any potential interference in past or current UK democratic processes. And our 30-year Russia strategy is designed to move us to a point where Russia chooses to work alongside the international community. Since the committee took evidence in January 2019, much more has been done. We've established the Defending Democracy Programme and strengthened our cross-government counter-disinformation capability. In March, we formally avowed the existence of the Joint State Threats Assessment Team. Earlier this month, we launched the UK Global Human Rights Sanctions Regime to target serious human rights abuses, with 25 Russian government officials already sanctioned. And we have committed to bring forward legislation to counter hostile state activity and espionage. This will modernise existing offences to deal more effectively with the espionage threat and consider what new offences and powers are needed. This includes reviewing the Official Secrets Acts and considering whether to follow our allies in adopting a form of foreign agent registration. We are taking action at every level. We've stepped up our response to illicit finance through the introduction of new powers by the Criminal Finances Act 2017, including unexplained wealth orders and the establishment of the multi-agency National Economic Crime Centre within the National Crime Agency. The rules on investment visas have already been tightened, but we will continue to consider whether any further changes are required to ensure that it cannot be abused. Let there be no doubt, we are unafraid to act wherever necessary to protect the UK and our allies from any state threat. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the ISC past and present and all involved in producing the Russia report. Until recently, the government had badly underestimated the Russian threat and the response it required. Not my words, but the damning indictment of deep systemic failings in the government's approach to security the Russia report sets out. And it isn't so much the government studied what was happening and missed the signs. The truth is they took a conscious decision not to look at all, as in the case of the 2016 referendum. And if there's any doubt about the failure of ministers to look, let me tell you what the report says. The written evidence provided to us appeared to suggest that Her Majesty's Government had not seen or sought evidence of successful interference in UK democratic processes. Who provided the written evidence? Check the footnote. The government itself. No wonder the government was so desperate to delay the publication of this report. Sitting on it for months and blocking its publication before a general election was a dereliction of duty. And let me say, Mr Speaker, we have no issue with the Russian people. It is the Russian state that is involved in a litany of hostile activity. Cyber warfare, interference in democratic processes, illicit finance and acts of violence on UK soil. 
And the report finds a failure of security departments to engage with this issue to the extent that the UK now faces a threat from Russia within its own borders. Does the Minister accept that this is in a situation when the UK is, as the report says, a top target for the Russian regime? And does the Minister also accept that on defending the UK's democratic processes and discourse, there was no single organisation offering leadership in government? Instead, it was, in the words of the report, a hot potato passed from one to another with nobody taking overall responsibility. I thank our security services for the work they do, but they need help, and this report makes clear they have not received the strategic support, the legislative tools or the resources necessary to defend our interest. The report concludes recent changes in resourcing to counter Russian hostile state activity are not or not only due to a continuing escalation of the threat, but appear to be an indication of playing catch-up. When will the government stop paying catch-up? Anyone who saw the Prime Minister's failure to engage on this at Prime Minister's questions will be extremely worried. When will the government treat this with the seriousness it deserves, act on the findings of the report and put the security of our country first? Well, Mr Speaker, I, uh, the one thing that I uh, agree with in terms of what the Right Honourable Gentleman has said is the threat that we face from Russia, as I made very clear in my opening statement in terms of all of the different varieties of threat that that presents itself. We recognise and have always recognised the enduring and significant threat posed by Russia, and Russia remains a top national security priority for this country. However, in terms of the other assertions that he makes, I, I reject them. And I think it is a bit rich for the Labour frontbench to lecture this government in respect of its stance in relation to Russia, given that the Foreign Secretary, uh, the Shadow Foreign Secretary herself, even said at the weekend that the Labour Party had got it wrong in relation to its position. The Right Honourable Gentleman highlighted the issue of strategy. And again, I would point to the Russia strategy that was implemented in 2017, and indeed the cross-government Russia unit that is focused on all of this and actually brings things together across government with accountability through the National Security Council. He highlights the issue of the protection of our democracy. And unlike the party opposite, I am proud that we stood on a manifesto, a Conservative manifesto, that committed to defend our democracy and highlighting that we will, in will protect the integrity of our democracy by introducing identification to vote at polling stations, stopping postal vote harvesting and measures to prevent any foreign interference in elections. And I look forward to the party opposite supporting those measures in a way that they did not in terms of their own manifesto uh, at the last general election. And in terms of uh, our approach, we are clear eyed in relation to the threat that Russia poses. That is why we have taken the steps that we have. And indeed, as I outlined, all of the different measures that we have implemented over the last months and years. And indeed, to set out that message to Russia, that whilst we want to maintain that dialogue with them, there can be that no normalization of our bilateral relationship until Russia ends the destabilizing activity that threatens the UK and our allies and undermines the safety of our citizens and our collective security. We take the issue of our national security incredibly seriously. And as I say, I will take no lectures from the party opposite in putting the interests of this country first. The Chair of the Intelligence and Security Committee, Dr Julian Lewis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given that the Minister has so much to say on this subject, it's really rather sad that it's having to be said in the context of an urgent question rather than a voluntary statement by the government. The Russia report could not have been produced to this high standard without the dedication, the expertise and above all the objectivity of the ISC's brilliant staff 
some of whom I've worked with previously. Yet according to the journalist Tim Walker, some people within government tried to sack the Secretariat and make political appointments. Will my right honourable friend, as I still regard him, resist the temptation to fob us off with clichés about not believing everything you read in the media and give this House now a categorical commitment that no party political special advisers will be allowed anywhere near the Intelligence and Security Committee. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the, uh, the, uh, my honourable friend in relation to what he has said about the work of the Intelligence and Security Committee of Parliament? And he will recall that he and I uh, shared uh, the Bill Committee establishing the ISC, and he will know the uh, weight and consideration that I give to it, and indeed the work of those officials and those who work uh, to support its activities, its inquiries, and its investigations. And uh, he can certainly have uh, my assurances to the weight and the support that I give to his committee. I commend the work of the previous committee uh, that has produced this report that is subject to this urgent question, and also commend all members of the committee for the work, the robust and rigorous work that I know that they will do during the course of this parliament. We, we now go to the SNP spokesperson, Stuart Malcolm MacDonald. Mr Speaker, unlike the Minister, I'll at least have the grace to congratulate the Honourable Gentleman on his uh, election to the Chairmanship of the Intelligence and Security Committee, and he'll have our backing and make sure he stays there, because he's an independent-minded person and he's the right person to chair that committee. And like him, I would thank the Committee for publication of the report. Uh, Mr Speaker, sir, there is a lot of stuff in there. This is a cow that is going to give us a lot of milk for quite some time, and I think it deserves to be taken seriously uh, and objectively. Uh, I think the issues it raises in relation to actively looking the other way as far as interference into the Brexit referendum need to be addressed and need to be addressed objectively by both the government and indeed by the opposition. That also applies to what it has to say about the Scottish referendum. I have banged on more about this than any other MP or politician in Scotland. In fact, in Scotland, Mr Speaker, my party has a stronger record on this than any other political party. So let's have the inquiry into Brexit and the 2014 referendum campaign. Let's bring that forward and let's be clear that that is only something that the United Kingdom government can do. And if it does, he will have my support in doing so. But can I ask him, when does the government intend to bring forward the legislation that he mentions, for example, on foreign agents, and can he also clarify that there will be ample time to debate the rather confused uh, and obscure effort across government in order to counter the threat seriously? Yeah, yeah. Minister Brelkenshire. What I say to the, uh, the hon. Gentleman is that we have produced our response to the committee's report, and I would commend him to uh, look at that, because it does underline on this issue that he highlights around an inquiry that it is the work of the intelligence and security agencies to assess any new evidence as it emerges. And given this long-standing approach, we do not believe it is necessary to hold a specific retrospective inquiry. If there were evidence available to be found, it would emerge through our existing processes and we have seen no evidence of successful interference in the way that has been described by some. And indeed, it does uh, leave, I think, many people to think that this is more about re-arguing some of the issues over the Brexit referendum itself, not respecting and reflecting the outcome of that referendum. In terms of the legislation, we are working at pace in relation to that, and I am quite sure that there will be plenty of opportunities in this House to debate that, as well as other issues related to this report. Thank you. Uh, Mr Speaker, this report highlights concerning aspects of Russian interference in UK affairs with a, a sinister combination of 21st century technology and tactics that are reminiscent of the Cold War. 
Much of the report is redacted for obvious reasons, but can my right hon. Friend assure the House that he is satisfied that where mistakes were made or where threats were underestimated, they are already being put right to ensure that our democracy and our economy are protected from nefarious influence now and in the future? Minister. Well, can I say to my honourable friend that uh, we keep all of our response under review? It's why I have highlighted all of the different measures and steps that are in place to guard against this risk from uh, action, interference, espionage by uh, any hostile uh, uh, states in terms of or hostile state activity in terms of what that requires. And so it is uh, why we, for example, in 2017, established the NSC endorsed Russia strategy. But he can have my assurance as to the steps that we have taken and the steps that we will continue to take to guard our security and ensure that national security is absolutely at the forefront. Others to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was not lost in the House that the Minister did not answer the question put to him by the yeah, Chairman of exactly. the Intelligence and Security exactly. Committee. Will we now do so, please? Minister. Well, I think uh, to respond to the Right Honourable Gentleman, I was very clear as to the weight and the importance of the independent scrutiny that the uh, ISC provides and why, uh, from uh, my perspective and the government's perspective, we will always examine and reflect carefully on the incredibly important work and the importance of that being conducted in the independent way that the ISC has always fulfilled its role and responsibility. And I am quite clear that that will continue into the future. Joe Gideon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The ISC report suggests that the SNP have questions to answer about Russian That's interference. Fair. Does my right honourable friend agree that given how Scotland and the independence referendum are at the centre of these allegations, it is right that the SNP explain what it knew about this issue and when? Minister Brokenshire. Honourable friend has made her point, I think, very clearly and firmly, and we will wait to see how the SNP uh, themselves respond to various points that have been flagged. Uh, but obviously, our priority is for the national security of the whole of our United Kingdom, and that work continues very firmly by this government. Kevin Jones. Hey, sir, I wish the member for Stoke and Trent, or the uh, special advisor who wrote that question, had actually read the report, because clearly she hasn't. One thing, one of the main recommendations from uh, the committee was the need for a bill to reform the Official Secrets Act and an Espionage Act. And I welcome what the Minister has announced today and more broadly and more informative in this morning's Times newspaper. Both the former Director of uh, MI5 and the right hon. Member for Bromsgrove, when he gave evidence to the, uh, to the uh, ISC, both supported this. The Law Commissioners in 2017 uh, asked, uh, set off a consultation uh, process uh, around this. It is yet to report. Could I ask the Minister when it will report? And can I urge him to really make sure that we do get this legislation in place? Because it is needed. And let's hope it's not going to just be some spin to take the headlines on the day after the report was announced. And let's actually get it into action. Minister Brokenshire. I agree with the honourable gentleman in terms of what he has said over legislation, and he will note that in the Queen's speech, we committed to introducing legislation to counter hostile state activity and espionage. I think it is right that we do put in place uh, steps that reflect things like the foreign agent registration type processes that do exist in other countries, as well as to receive the Law Commission's report in relation to the Official Secrets Act. I think what I can say to the uh, Honourable Gentleman today is the commitment of this government to act at pace and speed, to get this right and to ensure that we are doing our utmost to strengthen powers where they need to be strengthened, but in the interim to take all necessary action to call out, to highlight the Russian activity and take further action as appropriate. Tobias. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As a Select Committee Chair, could I welcome this report? I think scrutiny is good. It helps raise the bar and I think is also healthy for democracy. But for those who follow these events, it's long been recognised that Russia 
poses a national security threat. It's regularly buzzing our airspace with its uh, mix. And indeed, the Foreign Affairs Select Committee's Moscow's Gold Report highlighted many of the same issues in this report. Would the uh, Security Minister agree, though, that Russia's cyber and disinformation actions are indeed a reflection of the changing character of conflict, calibrated state-sponsored attacks designed to interfere with our politics and indeed our economy, but beneath the threshold of any military response? And would he agree that we need to quickly adapt to this new form of political competition? Minister. Uh, I do agree with what uh, my honourable friend has said, and I commend uh, the ISC and his committee for their work, for their reports, uh, and the way in which they have put this into focus. And I hope to assure him that uh, offensive cyber capabilities are now a critical part of our work, ensuring that we integrate that within our military and indeed some of our broader response to these issues as well. Obviously, bounded appropriately by legal and policy oversight, but he is right in highlighting the changing nature of conflict, the changing nature of activities against states, and why through our National Cyber Security Centre and other initiatives as well, we continue to enhance and be vigilant against the threat that is outlined. Chris Brown. I've been warning about Putin's Russia for 19 years now and called for the Magnitsky sanctions for 10 years. So what mystifies me is that government ministers are still giving out golden visas to dodgy Russian oligarchs, that ru government ministers are still granting exemptions to dodgy Russian oligarchs so that they can hide their ownership of businesses in this country, and I am mystified that government ministers are still taking millions of pounds from dodgy Russian oligarchs. We have to clean up our act, and it has to start with the government. Yeah. Minister. Well, I recognise the, the work that the honourable gentleman has done over a number of years, as he rightly points out, in relation to uh, Magnitsky sanction type regimes, and I hope he will recognise and welcome the steps that have been taken in that regard. Equally, I would highlight the work that we have done to tighten Tier 1 visas, the retrospective examination that it continues to go on over visas that were granted prior to 2015. And I can assure him of our continued review and our vigilance as to the abuse of our immigration system. And therefore, if further action is required, we will do so, as well as the transparency of the workings of uh, support for politics as well, which indeed this government has underlined through its manifesto commitment. Bob Sheila. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I fully accept what the Minister says about this government acting, and I give credit where credit's due, and I've met folks from the Russia unit, and I thank them for their work. However, from 2007 to at least 2014, as the Honourable, friend, uh, as the Honourable Member for the Ronda said eloquently, we were hugely complacent, and it damaged us. My question, Mr Speaker, is on the FARA, the foreign agent registration process, because I'm unclear. Is he talking about spies that making it illegal for the GRU to have people here, or is he talking about foreign lobbying? I've been calling for a foreign lobbying act now for two years, and the foreign agent registration process in the US is about foreign lobbying, which we badly need new and updated laws on. Minister. Well, I'm grateful to my, uh, my honourable friend for his question. And uh, what I would say to him is that we have been uh, examining the different laws in different countries that govern this, uh, this foreign agent registration. Uh, we're obviously drawing that together in terms of something that will be effective from a UK standpoint, but equally learning whether that has been effective, learning and applying that into our law as we prepare for the introduction of legislation countering espionage and countering hostile state activity, but look forward to continuing that discussion with him. Darren Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I declare my interest as the chair of the new all-party group on technology and national security, uh, and of course as a member of the Joint Committee on National Security. Um, the remarkable insight from this report was the lack of horizon scanning, understanding, uh, mitigation and response to modern threats from the technological frontier from hostile states. On the assumption that the minister agrees, we therefore need to invest in and enhance our capabilities in this technological frontier space. Can he set out for the House when he intends to come to this House with the government strategy to secure our national security? Yeah. Minister? 
I think uh, 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 honourable right honourable members will have heard what I have already said in my opening statement of the various different steps that have been taken about countering illicit finance dealing with the abuse, the potential abuse of visas, and indeed the investment through our national cyber security strategy uh, to counter actions uh, whereby uh, cyber is being exploited against us in so many different ways. That work continues, uh, and it's also, for example, how we continue to work with uh, those involved in the internet, uh, those involved in social media as well, on our online harms legislation, which we remain committed to as well. And I think that underlines the breadth of the response we're giving. John Powell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My right honourable friend may be aware that I have done more than most to try to stop the return of Russia to the Council of Europe. So I recognise the enduring threat that it poses. But does he share with me the belief that the Russia report largely underplays the bigger picture here and that there is a distinct risk to the UK through the international institutions to which we jointly belong? Minister. Well, I think, I think my honourable friend and I pay tribute to him for all of uh, his work uh, in the fact that uh, Russia seeks to advance this sense of a state that supports the rules-based order, and yet, through all of its other actions, we can see that there is this fundamentally different approach. Uh, so I, I do underline that, that sense that he's uh, focused on in terms of multilateral organisations, how we need to be, again, clear-eyed as to the threats and risks that are posed there, and look forward to working with him and others as we continue to call that out and ensure that our interests are best reflected through those very organisations in upholding the rules-based order. Clive Batty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, the Minister still hasn't answered the question posed by the Right Honourable Member for New Forest East. Mm. He's alleged that there was a political attempt to remove the Secretariat of the ISC and replace it with political place men or women. Now, can the Minister say was he aware of that? Yes or no? Yeah. Minister. Well, I'm, I'm happy to say to the honourable gentleman, I, I do not have any knowledge of what he is saying. I do not recognise that at all. And from my standpoint, it is important that the ISC is able to conduct uh, its work and be able to present to this House its report, given the mandate that this House provided to it through the legislation establishing it. Click Drummond. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I pay tribute to all those working in the British Intelligence and Security Services, both putting their lives at risk, both here and abroad, including my father, who spent 45 years working for the government, facing the Soviet Union as the enemy during the Cold War. This report highlights that, as we've always done, we need to adjust and adapt to a new battlefield. So can the Minister assure me that the intelligence services and armed forces will get, give, will get every resource and legislation they need to be effective? Minister. Well, like my honourable friend, I too pay tribute to the work of our world-leading and incredible intelligence and security agencies, the steps that they take day in, day out to assure our security, and we should all be proud and supportive of their actions. My honourable friend will know that there is an integrated review and a spending review that is now ongoing, but uh, she can have my assurances to the importance and the emphasis that uh, we give to our national security and I am sure as this process continues how that is best reflected so that we can be protected and guard our future against the range of different threats that are out there and looking to undermine this country and why we stand firm against that. Let's head to Yorkshire and visit Dame Diana Johnson. Dame Diana Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. For years when I campaigned for the Infected Blood Inquiry, I was familiar with the nothing to see here response from Whitehall until it was decided that there was something to see. And if a chief constable played down a spate of local muggings because police choose, chose not to investigate, any MP worth their salt would not accept that. Now, it shouldn't be any different when it comes to properly investigating and taking action to protect our national security and democratic 
democratic institutions by those who wish to subvert and weaken us, divide our country and break up our alliances. Therefore, shouldn't any very welcome measures taken to strengthen national security be taken in the full knowledge of what those weaknesses actually are by having an inquiry into any Russian interference in 2016? Minister. Well, what I would say to the Honourable Lady is that our work is informed by regular assessment by our security and intelligence agencies that therefore ensure that there is this dynamic response. And hence the reason why uh, we are not persuaded of this call for some sort of separate inquiry. We have seen the ISC's report. We have responded to that. But we are vigilant against the threats and challenges that are there in defending our democracy and indeed why we have a defending democracy program that is looking at further steps and further legislation to underpin that. So she can certainly have this government's commitment that we stand firm on those issues and therefore the uh, security work that continues to inform all of our actions. Andy Carter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I pick up on the point made by my right honourable friend, the member for Bournemouth East? Russia does pose a serious threat to this country and it is changing that threat. So can my right honourable friend confirm that the government will continue to work with NATO and our other international allies to tackle this threat and that we'll be resolute in defending our country, our democracy and our values from a hostile state? Minister. I can give that assurance to my honourable friend and the importance of NATO is, is one that I recognise so clearly. Indeed, the work that NATO does on cyber as well and the support for others. And, uh, and certainly in that context, for example, the steps that we continue to take to support our allies uh, in the Baltic and, uh, and the, the challenges that remain there, the strength of NATO and how that guards our security and remains so important to our future policy. Deirdre Brutt. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. The committee said that government ministers didn't want to know, didn't want to ask about Russian interference in elections and referendums. It seems they didn't want to know and didn't want to ask about dark money funnelled into the Brexit referendum through the DUP by a former Scottish Tory vice chair, Richard Cook, either. How will he stop foreign donations polluting our elections? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh it seems as if, uh, again, the, uh, the issue is about trying to rerun the, the Brexit referendum. But I would say to the Honourable Lady, in terms of her broader point, it is precisely through the Defending Democracy programme that we are seeking to take further steps to safeguard our voting system, our democracy. And I hope that she supports all of that with all of the measures that I identified earlier on in terms of uh, the way in which we want to see individual voter ID, for example. But she should also know the transparency that we have and the fact that we do not accept foreign donations as well as stepping our response around illicit finance through our National Crime Agency. Steve Bryan. Thank you. Can I recommend to my right honourable friend uh, this Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee report published yesterday into misinformation in the pandemic? It makes clear that state campaigns, including those from Russia, lie at the heart of that. And would he agree that social media companies hold great power, yet have been left largely unaccountable for their inaction? And what reflections does he have on the ISC report generally, which has caused great interest in this House and in certain parts of this country? But what does he think it will be arguably welcomed by President Putin in Russia? Minister. Well, my honourable friend makes uh, a number of, uh, I think, very relevant points, for example, over the role of the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, and also the need for social media companies to do more, to step up. And that's why we are introducing online harms legislation and really looking at the further role that they require. This point about disinformation is one that uh, I do recognise and therefore the important work of the Cross Whitehall Counter Disinformation Unit that is reflected, I'm sure, into the report that he references, and I will certainly look at that. But I think the important thing that we need to send in terms of a message from this House, in terms of the IC report, is that sense of vigilance, that sense of being clear-eyed as to the threats that do get posed from Russia, but equally how we are not uh, picking an issue with the Russian people it is the Russian state, it is the Russian government, and therefore looking to them to shift their position, which is what our strategy is all about. 
In order to get everybody in, it will be helpful if we can speed up the questions and the answers. We go to Wales with Howell Williams. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Further to the question from the member for the Ronda, and for absolute clarity for people watching this session at home, Russians investing £2 million or more in the UK can get a visa and in five years can convert that visa into citizenship. Doesn't this mean that restricting political donations to British citizens is no real defence? Minister. I will answer the point over the Tier 1 investor visa, which I think that uh, the Honourable Gentleman is referencing. Work is ongoing on reviewing uh, the past visas uh, and, indeed, uh, in terms of uh, looking at further changes as needs be, if that is required in our national interest, that is what we will do. David Mundell. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. In the context of uh, this report, does my right honourable friend agree with me that it is absolutely shameful that Alex Salmond, the former First Minister of Scotland, yeah, yeah, yeah. remains in the pay of the yeah. Kremlin as an apparatchik of Russia today, and so few nationalists condemn him for it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many I think my right honourable friend, in his customary and very powerful way, sets out this position over Russia today. Those who have supported it, those who've been engaged in it. And we have, I think, all questions, firm questions and doubts and real concerns about the objectivity, the objectivity of Russia today and why it is right that we have Ofcom and other agencies that are there, the independence of Ofcom and its regulation and therefore the need to step up and make sure that that sense of... Jim oh, Shannon. Mr Speaker, uh, can I... Uh, the Minister of State Security will be familiar, familiar with the, uh, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I believe Russia is, is one of those horsemen that's a real danger to, to the free world. So can the Minister further outline what lessons we have learned from the report to counter act the very real presence of Russian interference, especially in the social media aspect? And how do we balance safety with our inalienable right to hold and express our political opinions? Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I know the Honourable Gentleman has dropped a few questions into there. I think the point is that we are taking this forward in relation to our online harms legislation, working with uh, social media and other companies to see that information is valid, that we don't have that sense of disinformation and being vigilant against the threats that are posed. Jacob Young. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, does my right honourable friend agree with me that Mr Putin sees the potential weakening of our United Kingdom as a win for Russian interests and that our country is better defended, better protected and better together? Right, right, Jacob. Minister. Absolutely. I, I endorse what my honourable friend has said so succinctly and so clearly as the interests of our United Kingdom in standing together, being united in that way, and that we very firmly are better together. We're heading to the northwest with Abzul Khan. Abzul Khan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the ISC's report, it states the Russian influence in the UK has become the new normal. Individuals with close links to Putin are now well integrated into the UK's business and social scene and accepted because of their wealth. Surrounding these oligarchs is an industry of enablers who wittingly or unwittingly help to extend Russian influence and the nefarious interests of the Russian state in the UK. What steps will the minister now take to tackle the growth of this industry and the ability of the wealthy individuals to influence British politicians, parties, and our democracy? Minister. Dirty money, money obtained through criminality or corruption has no place uh, in this country. And there should be no doubt that we will ensure the full weight of the law enforcement regime bears down on those who look to use, move or hide the proceeds of crime. Our National Crime Agency is vigilant. We've introduced unexplained wealth orders and we will continue to enhance our legislation to ensure that corruption is rooted out and where there is dirty money, that that's identified and seized and action is very firmly taken. Mr Speaker, as a former Special Advisor at the Ministry of Defence during both the Syrian and Ukrainian conflicts, I am well aware of the threat that Russia continues to pose to the UK and our allies. But can my right honourable friend clarify what will be the immediate next steps that the government will be taking to counter the disinformation and cyber attacks, including to the vital work at the moment on the coronavirus vaccine? Minister. 
Well, the disinformation point is, is a very relevant one. We have our counter disinformation unit, which is led by the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, bringing all of that action together across government to actually highlight and call out, work with the social media companies over this important time. It's done incredibly important work uh, to guard against that disinformation now, as it has done before, and therefore it will continue to do that, as well as leading towards the online harms legislation that I've already spoken to. Bill Esterson. Let's park the lines from Mr Cummings, shall we? The Conservative Party takes money from the Russians. Number 10 suppressed the report. And the Prime Minister forgot that his first duty is the security of the British people. So will the Minister go away and tell the Prime Minister to investigate the Kremlin's role in undermining our democracy? Well, I will, I will take no lectures from the uh, Labour Party opposite, indeed the whips question that the Honourable Gentleman has uh, given to me. This government, uh, my party, is vigilant on issues of national security. We will remain so and be clear-eyed as to the threat that Russia poses and where further action is taken, uh, is need to be taken. As I've said today, we will do so. Christian Wakeford. Ronnie Cowan in Scotland. Ronnie Cowan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. The report said it has been surprisingly difficult to establish who has responsibility for what. And that conclusion is supported by the government's response, which alludes to the responsibilities of the Paymaster General. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, DCMS, the Home Office, the Defence Secretary, the Foreign Secretary and the PM. At 10 a.m. this morning, we still didn't know who had done the short straw and would come to the House to defend the indefensible. Is this report, the government's delay in publishing it and its reaction to it, just another example of the incompetence and arrogance that we've come to expect from this Conservative and Unionist government? Minister. Uh, no, uh, and I'm very comfortable in terms of underlining that commitment that this government has in terms of defending our national security. And in terms of the point that he makes about structure, well, actually, it is about having a whole government approach, ensuring that we do have each part of government engaged, working. And this concept of fusion in drawing this together, that is what we do with having our National Security Council and the accountability through that to deliver against it. Anderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will my right honourable friend confirm for the people of Wolverhampton that our intelligence and security agencies are capable of identifying and dealing with any threat in the involving battle space. Minister. Well, I can, I can say to him of the support, the resourcing that is given to our intelligence and security agencies, how we, I think, have such world leading capabilities and can be proud of the work that they do for us and therefore for his constituents in Wolverhampton and indeed for constituents across the country as well. That support that we give to them in defending our security. Go to Yorkshire with Dan Jarvis. Dan Jarvis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The ISC stressed the need to ensure that our response to the threat from Russia is not solely focused on national events and organisations. So can I ask the Minister, therefore, what he intends to do to protect our public sector our NHS and local government services, which he knows all about, from malicious Russian cyber intrusion once funding for the National Cyber Security Programme comes to an end in March of next year. Minister. Well, I'm grateful to the point the Honourable Right Honourable Gentleman makes, because this issue of our cyber defences is one that this government has invested in very clearly. Uh, he highlights the point of the National Cyber Security Centre, and I know the work that they do with uh, local government, indeed the devolved administrations too, in being vigilant against the threats. Indeed, only last week, calling out Russian activity against pharmaceutical and other companies as well, to ensure that that knowledge is there and therefore to be able to guard against it. Garnick. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This morning on the radio, Commissioner Cressida Dick said, I do think people should be concerned about the threat from Russia. Can the Minister assure me that our security services will work with our police services to make sure they have the data, the information and the resources to deal with any local threats? Minister. 
Well, I can say to my right honourable friend that there is a very strong join up between our security and intelligence agencies as well as our police. Indeed, when looking at the, the work that I do each week, I see that join up and see that work. So she can absolutely have my assurance in that regard. Let's head to Walthamstow with Stella Creasy. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister has told us today that he's confident there is no need for an investigation into any potential Russian interference in the EU referendum, because if there had been, it would have been detected by existing processes. Given this report sets out that there was Russian interference in other referendums and they continue to be involved in British politics, why does he think the Russians chose to sit that one out? Minister. Well, I, again, I think that, that uh, we're certainly hearing some questions to try and refight the referendum. I think actually we should respect that. And that's what this government has done. That's what we've been elected on a mandate to do to deliver on the Brexit referendum. But she certainly has my assurance of the vigilance that we have against that sense of intrusion, the disinformation and all of the steps that I've outlined today in terms of guarding against that. Stuart. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It comes as no surprise to me that the Russian state seeks to infiltrate and influence so many aspects of our society. But I'm particularly worried by Russian cyber activities, especially attempts to steal our secrets, intellectual property and new technologies. I know that in recent years more resources have been given to the security and intelligence services, particularly GCHQ and the Army's uh, MOD's 77th Brigade. But does my right honourable friend agree with me that our offensive cyber capabilities may well have to be enhanced further given the persistent and increasing threats from Russia. Minister. Well, my honourable friend, with all of his experience, has highlighted a, a very important point about the need for offensive cyber capabilities, and we were the first uh, NATO ally to offer offensive cyber capabilities to the Alliance. I'm quite sure that this is an issue that will be of core interest and focus as we look at the integrated review. And he sets out that compelling argument for further investment. And I'm quite sure that will be reflected upon very, very carefully. Uh, thank you very much. Mr Speaker, despite repeated requests and reminders from right honourable members of this House, for 10 long months, this government dithered and delayed, tried its very best to suppress the Russia report, and now we all know why. Given the threat to our national security and that it was about preserving and protecting our very democracy itself, how could this government have been so incompetent, been asleep at the wheel, and not even ask the bare minimum obvious questions? Yeah. Minister. Well, I don't actually recognise at all the characterisation that the Honourable Gentleman provides. And I welcome the fact that uh, speedily after its uh, creation that the ISC has published this report, has shone a light on the issue of Russia, that sense of the need for vigilance, which this government continues to have. And therefore, it is that approach that we take through from this, uh, rather than the political characterisation that the Honourable Gentleman has sought to proffer. Beggar. Mr Speaker, the ISC report rightly thanks five Russia experts from outside the intelligence community, two of whom have done some great work with the Legatum Institute. Will my right honourable friend join me in thanking those individuals, the Institute and indeed their visionary founder Christopher Chandler for having the courage and the commitment to expend the resources and take the risks to oppose Russian wrongdoing from the private sector? Minister. I commend, uh, I commend uh, Legatum and uh, all those who have sought to assemble evidence of the uh, impact and effect. Indeed, how I think that that has added to the uh, report that the ISC have produced. And therefore, I look forward to that continuing as the ISC gets into its stride in this session. And therefore, the contribution that so many people have to offer in seeing that the ISC does its job well and can therefore work to ensure that our response to these issues of national security are as well informed as possible. Margaret Farrier in Scotland. Margaret Farrier. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As if it wasn't bad enough that we have unelected peers making major decisions for Scotland, the report raises serious questions about several members of the House of Lords and their links to business interests in Russia and the potential for those relationships to be exploited by the Russian state. Will the government urgently support measures to enhance scrutiny 
of the incomes of the Lords to the same level as the rules for registering MPs' interests. Minister. I, I agree that the transparency of information about political donations is incredibly important. I should say to the Honourable Lady that the, the relevant code is the responsibility of the House itself, and it is kept under review by the House of Lords Conduct Committee. And I am confident that the Conduct Committee will give due consideration to the clear recommendations that the report from the ISC has made. Peter Gibson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The people of Darlington voted to leave the EU in 2016. Does my right honourable friend agree that the referendum accurately recorded the genuine will of the people and that the government was right to deliver on that mandate and take us out of the EU? <laughs> Quite sure that fits in with our subject. So what I'm going to do is move on to a vet group and chairs like the committee. Thank you. I'm grateful, Mr Speaker. I served on the ISC in the late 90s and we had a big Labour majority in Parliament and a Conservative chair, the much respected Tom King. And there is a long tradition of members of both houses putting aside party politics to engage in independent scrutiny of the vital work that our intelligence agencies do and to work crucially in support of the national interest. The government puts that at risk at its peril. So can he answer the current chair question. Will he now rule out any attempt at government interference in the work of the ISC, any political appointments to its secretariat, any special advisers to be appointed to him? Will he rule that out now? Yes or no? Minister. I'm, I'm very clear on the, the need for independence by the ISC, as I have responded to in previous questions. And certainly I do not... Uh, I do not want to see the, the sense of that question of its independence being drawn into any doubt. It is important that the ISC is independent and rigorous, and the Honourable, the Right Honourable Lady can have my assurance in terms of the steps that I take to uphold that. So, final question, this should count. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Russia is attacking our democratic structures, and internationally, Russia and others are also undermining our greatest assets, our alliances and multilaterals. So does my right honourable friend agree that we need a unit at the Foreign Office specifically focused on protecting our interests and upholding the democratic nature of elections of presidents and chairs of multilateral organisations? Minister. Say to my right honourable friend that yes, I absolutely recognise the different threats, the different challenges that are there, and it is why we do have the Government Russia unit, which brings together the diplomatic, intelligence, and military capabilities to maximum effect. How there is a specific uh, lead uh, official at the Foreign Office that is responsible for our work on Russia, and therefore the important point that she makes of that vigilance, of that need to draw that information together, is absolutely in place, and we will continue to ensure that the interests of this country through that work is at the forefront and that we defend our nation's security. In order to allow the safe exit of honourable members participating in this item of business and the safe arrival of those participating in the next, I am suspending the House for three minutes. Order.